Hello, I'm June Edwards, and it's almost Thanksgiving. I've got my turkey shirt on, and I feel like a turkey, uh, having all these things I got to do to get ready for it. But before that, I get to meet with you guys, and we're going to look at the history of Thanksgiving and how things have changed over the last 400 years or so. First, let's look at the events for this week, starting with November 22nd. The 22nd is Stop the Violence Day. It is also the fall of the Inca Empire in 1533. And it is Button Day. I don't have any buttons on today, although I do have my, my festive shirt on for Thanksgiving. Uh, the 23rd is National Cashew Day. On the 24th, we remember that Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species in 1859, and that set off a whole firestorm between creationism and evolution. Also, I forgot to mention on the 22nd, that JFK, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated in 1963. And on the 24th, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, assassinated by Jack Ruby the same year. And we think that he was the one who killed JFK. The motivational speaker, Dale Carnegie, who wrote many, many books on how to win friends and influence people, was born on November 24th in 1888. November 25th, the last British troops left the uh, newly formed America uh, and left New York City after the American Revolutionary War in 1783. And I think the Americans had a party when they left. Andrew Carnegie, a famous American financier and philanthropist who opened many, many libraries, was born November 25th in 1835. Also this year, Thanksgiving falls on November 25. Uh, it's always the fourth Thursday of the year, so it's different, different days, different years. November 26th, Charles Schultz, a cartoonist who invented Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Lucy and the Peanuts cartoon, was born in 1922. It is also National Cake Day, the day after Thanksgiving. And in uh, the 1920s, early 1922, King Tut Commons tomb was explored by Carter and Lord Carnivan, and they both mysteriously died soon after. So they say that there was the curse on the Egyptian tomb. The 27th is Pins and Needles Day, and also in 1701, astronomer Anders Celsius, who invented the Celsius temperature scale used in Europe and Asia, was born in 1701. The 28th in 1521, the explorer Magellan reached the Pacific Ocean. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, was born November 28th, 1628. November 25th, a famous author, Louisa May Alcott, was born in 1832, and she wrote Little Women, and later the sequel, Little Men. Also the famous uh, author, Madeline Langle, was born in 1918. The first airplane flight to the South Pole happened on November 29th. And one more famous author, C.S. Lewis, born 1898. My November has a lot of famous authors. And the last day of November 
Winston Churchill, born November 30th, 1894, helped save England and convinced FDR from the United States to join World War II and saved all of us really from the Nazis. Mark Twain was born as Samuel Clemens in 1835. And November 30th, stay at home because you're well day. Well, maybe you're going out and celebrating Black Friday, Black Saturday and Black Sunday. Who knows? But let's look <clears throat> at the miracle of Thanksgiving survival. Why should we still celebrate Thanksgiving each year? The first settlers left England and the Netherlands because of problems. They were jailed, beaten, ridiculed, given the worst jobs, if any work at all, all because they wanted to worship in a different way. The journey to the New World was continually delayed almost three months because of the leaky Speedwell ship, which was 300 miles out to sea and forced to return to England. Number three, hurricane season had started and a sailor was swept overboard. There were many miserable with seasickness and the lack of adequate food. Number four, the first explorations were during a cold winter in the New England area, where out of 102 people, only half the people survived. Only four women lived to see the spring. For a while, the kids who remained the healthiest had to run everything. The next one, the dead were buried secretly at night because the people were fearful the Indians would discover just how vulnerable they really were. Samoset and Squanto were Indians who spoke some English. Squanto persuaded his powerful chief, Massasoit, not to massacre the newcomers, but help them and help broker a peace treaty that lasted more than 50 years. Squanto educated the city bred settlers on using fish as fertilizer fishing with a better hook or nets, planting corn and squash, and taught them how to hunt. Remember, they were urban dwellers from London and the Netherlands. The Mayflower ship crew grew to respect the Puritans and decided to remain until April to help build the many shelters required to survive. The next fall, Harvest was so much better. And William Bradford in his two volume of Plymouth Plantation wrote that they would invite their new Indian friends and hold a feast to thank God, quote, who delivered them from all ye perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on ye firm and stable earth. Our fathers were Englishmen who came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried unto ye, Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity. Let them therefore praise ye, Lord, because he is good and his mercies endure forever. End of quote. Well, <clears throat> that uh, reminds me of a Thanksgiving drama at my house. I remember a Thanksgiving with my family when I was about six years old. My mother worked hard in the kitchen to prepare the turkey meal. My two older sisters were busy helping peel potatoes and lay out the holiday tablecloth on her dining room table. My job was to set out the cloth napkins and the silverware. The plates were stacked at the head of the table in daddy's place. Our food was traditional with two kinds of cranberries, jellied and berry, corn, peas, candied yams, mashed potatoes, and turkey with stuffing served on a white platter. There was coffee for the grown-ups and milk for the children. We also had water in water glasses at each place setting. My two-year-old brother threw a tantrum. Maybe he was overtired from the excitement of the holiday. Maybe he was upset about something else. At any rate, 
My daddy took him into the bathroom for a tough spanking. I strongly objected when I saw him returning with his flushed chubby cheeks, tears streaming down his face and loudly yelling, no, with all his two-year-old might. I was the indignant big sister defending my brother. My dad looked at me sternly and said, maybe you need a spanking too. I had a vision of being unceremoniously tipped over his knee, staring at the cold tile floor while he whacked me with his belt. I could feel the pain. So I did the best thing I could do as a six-year-old big sister. I shut up. The lesson I learned back in the early 1960s was that no matter how much I loved my little brother, I was thankful it wasn't me getting a spanking. I was learning when to mind my own business. That was just a part of having the paddle of wisdom applied to the sea of knowledge. And it wasn't a bad lesson to learn either. Well, you know, uh, there's always been problems that people have had and we've got some painters who painted wonderful pictures to show it. Gilbert Tucker Margerson painted the Mayflower at Sea. He was born in 1852 and lived until 1940. And boy, does this say it all. Look at that hurricane weather that blew them so many hundreds of miles off course. And then the Mayflower Compact was painted by Jean-Louis Jerome Ferris in 1825. This is where the strangers and the pilgrims and the sailors all signed and agreed that they would help each other and survive in the new world. Edward Percy Moran was an American artist Born 1862, lived to 1935. The Pilgrim's Landing was painted in the early 1900s. And this is what people thought they probably looked like. There was an antique postcard around 1928, the landing of the Pilgrims. And I don't know who the author was, but look, at the snow. George Henry Bolton, born in 1833, lived to 1905. In 1867, he painted Pilgrims Going to Church at 34 years of age, and it hung in the New York Public Library and may still be there today. Jenny Augusta Brownscombe, born in 1850, lived to 1936, painted the first Thanksgiving at 64 years of age in 1914. This painting is located in Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Thought to be pretty authentic. Before cameras, so the artists really had to paint the best they could. Jean Louis Jerome Ferris, American painter, painted the first Thanksgiving in 1915 at the age of 52 years. This one is also located in the Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and it shows the feast when unexpectedly 90 Indians showed up for dinner. Massasoit was kind enough to send his braves out to kill six deer and assorted partridges and other game to flesh out the meal. And the feast lasted three whole days. Now, I like Norman Rockwell. You know, he got more serious as he got older. But this is one he did in 1923 called Ye Glutton. And it shows a pilgrim in the stocks. Ate way too much food at the feast. One that he did near the end of World War II 
1945, home for Thanksgiving for a Saturday evening post cover. You remember this one? And the veteran is helping his mother peel potatoes. And she's just looking at him and thanking God with all her heart that your boy is back home safe and sound. Here's another fun one from Norman Rockwell, then in 1951, A Pilgrim's Progress. And this boy is being shot with arrows, but he took the gun out and tried to steal some of their turkeys from their traps. And they're trying to get him back. Look at what that little rascal did. He better run. And then there were four freedoms. And one of the freedoms that Norman Rockwell painted in the 1950s was the American freedom from want. And there's mama and papa serving the turkey and everybody's looking and laughing and wondering who's gonna get the wishbone. And look at that beautiful white tablecloth in the china and papa's getting ready to carve the turkey. You know, William Bradford was a founder and longtime governor of the Plymouth Colony. Born in England, he migrated with the congregation to the Netherlands as a teenager. He was among the passengers on the Mayflower's transatlantic journey. He helped draft the legal code and became Plymouth Colony governor for more than 30 years when the original governor died during the first harsh winter. He facilitated a community centered on private agriculture and religious tolerance. Around 1630, he began to compile his two volume of Plymouth Plantation, one of the most important early chronicles of the settlement of New England. He expressed his non-conforming religious feelings in his early teens and joined the famous separatist church at the age of 17. He immigrated to the Netherlands in 1609. For 11 years, they tried to make it in a foreign culture. And they finally embarked on the Mayflower for the voyage to North America. They arrived in what became Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1621 with a large number of non-separatist settlers. Before disembarking the ship, the congregation drew up the first New World Social Contract, which all the male settlers signed, known as the Mayflower Compact. Bradford served 31 years as governor of the fledgling colony between 1622 and 1656. He acted as chief magistrate, high judge and treasurer and presided over the deliberations of the general court, which was the legislature community. In 1636, he helped draft the first legal code Plymouth never became a Bible commonwealth like its larger, more influential neighbor, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Plymouth settlers were relatively tolerant of dissent. They did not restrict the worship of people uh, who did not belong to their church, but they were pretty tolerant considering those days. Around 1630, he began to compile his two volume of Plymouth Plantation. His history was singular because it separated religious from secular concerns. He did not interpret temporal affairs as the unfolding of God's plan. He was not dogmatic like the Puritans of the Great Migration, but he steered a middle course for Plymouth between the Holy Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the more tolerant secular community of Rhode Island. The book, his journal disappeared for a couple hundred years, turned up in the tower where Paul Revere had set his light to warn that the British were coming during the early 
years of the American Revolution. British soldiers got the Plymouth Colony Journal, took it back to England. It disappeared again until the mid 1800s where it was discovered in the Church of England. The, mayor, the governor of Massachusetts sent emissaries over to the, uh, the high priest, uh, Bishop of Canterbury, and finally got permission and got them to return the journal to its rightful place in Massachusetts, where it is to this day. And why did it survive so well? Because it was not made from the modern day acid, acidic paper that we use now that disintegrates so quickly. It was made from a much more stalwart type of paper and it is even still legible to this day. Sometimes progress doesn't always move forward. Now I have something to read to you called After the Turkey is Gone. And this is a poem by Joanna Fuchs. After the turkey is gone, then what? Will we keep in mind the blessings for which we claim to be thankful? Or will we allow the chaos of everyday life, real and imagined problems, to intrude into the contentment we felt on Thanksgiving Day? The cranberries, the stuffing and pie, a dim memory. Will we focus on trivial irritations? Or will we hold on to what's really important? The deep, satisfying, good things we have instead of what we imagine we want, but haven't got. After the turkey is gone, cling to the blessings. Remember what makes life worth living. Continue thanksgiving. And I want to show you a couple more beautiful scenes because our autumn season is going to be ending very quickly. We're going to be moving into the next season. So I've got just a few more beautiful paintings that I wanted to show you. It's such a lovely, lovely time of the month. Now I have a few questions for you to think about since I'm not there to hold a discussion with you. Number one, what do you remember about Thanksgiving from when you were a child? Think about the food served, who attended, any family customs or funny memories. Number two, how was Thanksgiving celebrated when you were a young adult and when you had a family of your own? Number three, how will this year's Thanksgiving be different? Number four, can you name five blessings for which you are thankful? And number five, why is the holiday of Thanksgiving so important to Americans? It is the envy of other cultures who have decided to copy our idea of Thanksgiving, but it truly started out as a unique American holiday. And that's it for this wonderful Thanksgiving season. I wish you happy holidays. I will see you in about a week. And I hope I'm not five pounds heavier. Bye, everybody. Stay good. Eat well. <laughs>